Movement Network. Hello, Mark Coppola here with another edition of the Valhalla Movement Superhero Academy podcast. And today we've got a very special guest. But before I get to him, I do want to tell you a little bit about the Valhalla Agency. So Valhalla Agency is exactly, maybe exactly what you might think it is. It's basically our own in-house marketing agency that we run the Valhalla Movement with, whether it be our videos, our photos, social media management, newsletter management, basically all our on kind of online talent is up for hire for social enterprises. So we don't want to be able to be hired by anybody. We want to work to empower other enterprises that are doing amazing things. And we feel that you know, so many social entrepreneurs are out there, but they're they're sometimes lacking the the expertise or sometimes they're lacking the people that they need on their teams to take on some of the jobs. So we decided not only for the financial security of uh, some of our members, but as well as just for the movement as a whole that, you know, we would take on some of this work and that all like a portion of the proceeds would always go into the Valhalla movement and our land here in Montreal, uh, as well as other kind of potential communities that are uh, sprouting up uh, at the moment. So if you guys want to learn more about that, you guys can check out agency.valhallamovement.com. Now, you can also go and check out our second sponsor, who is the Higher Purpose Project. Um, they are a an event run and started by my, my very good friend, Dan Adams. And I've been to this event twice now as a speaker, as a videographer, as somebody who's just helping out in many ways, shape or form. And I got to say, it's transformative. It's incredible what Dan has been able to pull over uh, and, and pull out over the last maybe year and a half or so. He's run a number of these events with so many awesome speakers and people, and it's just so motivating. It really helps you connect with that higher purpose in your life. To even if you've already feel like you found it, it helps you kind of reconnect to it. So I do suggest that you uh, go check it out. Um, if you go and 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 you want to sign up. If you mention Valhalla or you mention my name, Mark Angelo Cabola, you will be able to also get uh, some special treatment. And that will kick back to also a small donation that will go back to the Valhalla movement as well. So please do go check it out. Um, it's definitely worth your time. But speaking of purpose driven organizations, we've got today one of the co founders of Manitoba Harvest. And you might not, maybe not recognize the name because branding isn't so um, prevalent on some of their most popular products. But if you've ever eaten hemp hearts or you've ever had any hemp-based food, well, chances are Manitoba Harvest probably made it. Uh, now, they're not the only company in the world, obviously, that makes hemp foods, but they are definitely some of the, one of the most popular ones. And it's something that um, was co-founded by Alex. I'm going to butcher your name again. Schwefsky? Schwiaski. Schwiaski. Yes, yes. Sorry. Totally no butchered that. So hard to write. Or sorry to say. Um, no just because I'm looking at it here and it, it just it confuses me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so one of the co-founders of Manitoba Harvest, uh, Alex. So thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Yeah, thanks. Pleasure for being here. And uh, I'm uh, grateful uh, Danielle connected us. Yeah, absolutely. So, Manitoba Harvest, making hemp-based foods. That's pretty awesome. You got to tell me the story of how this started and, and you know, what drove you to, to create this with your friends. Um, well, that's a good question. And uh, I guess it'll take us back to the, the earliest days, um, even predating Manitoba Harvest, which uh, was co-founded... Uh, with myself, uh, Mike Fada, and uh, Martin Moravchik. And uh, Martin Moravchik and I were actually uh, co-founders in a company that we started five years previous to Manitoba Harvest called the Emperor's Clothing Company. And we were the first importers of hemp clothing and fabric from Thailand and Nepal, uh, wow. which we first brought in in 1993. And so for... 
uh, five years uh, uh, leading up to 98 to the formation of Manitoba Harvest. We were involved in hemp clothing, uh, primarily from Nepal and Thailand, um, manufacturing, promoting. We had um, one of the earliest hemp-based stores in Canada called the Hemp Exchange in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. which we opened in 1995 as a retail store. Um, so dur during the days of the Emperor's Clothing Company, we, uh, we would actually do the uh, cannabis cups in Amsterdam starting <laughs> in 1994. Mm -hmm. And we did that till, uh, till 1998. Till, and we were the, in 1995, it was the cannabis cup Hemp Expo. So for the first time, they actually acknowledged hemp side of the non-psychoactive side of uh, cannabis. Had an expo, and we were the only actual hemp company. All the other companies were either um, seed companies or grow equipment, which is all great. But we were so for a hemp expo, really there really wasn't. It was it was us showing up. Mm, uh, but wow. but because of going to these. Uh, cannabis cups we got to be exposed to things that were going on in Europe mm -hmm. and one of the things in the uh, 90, 96 cannabis cup 90, was that we got we found some hemp seed that was very low in THC mm -hmm. from Ukraine there was a, a Ukrainian guy set up there Ukraine has always had a, a very colorful hemp history Still it's interesting how how today. northern kind of like the, like the Russian Ukrainian area seems to produce a whole lot of different hemp seeds and strains uh, that are kind of accepted around the world. It's pretty interesting. I I, I didn't expect that actually. Yeah, well, it's uh, either did we, and uh, we were really excited that we came across that uh, this little treasure and uh, and what you know what we then did was um, we brought this. Now we had low THC seed. Actually, I'm going a little. What uh, I'm kind of talking about an early, earlier story, but part of the cat, which I'll get back to. Sorry, but part of the cannabis cup is that we also came across hemp hearts, which you know shelled hemp seed for the first time in 1997, mm -hmm. and that really excited us. Until then, it was really only a couple companies at night. I had a cold press hemp seed oil. But there was no further innovation beyond that really back then. And finding these, the shelled hemp seed was very exciting. Uh, we brought that back to Manitoba. And um, we went to a place just outside Winnipeg in Portage of Prairie. It was called the Food Development Center. Mm -hmm. Without their help, we definitely would not be here today. And we, so we brought this hemp seed, uh, shelled hemp seed, and we're like, how do you make this? And <laughs> they, they taught us how to make it, what machines to get and what process to put in place. And, and uh, pretty much from that, uh, finding that um, little gem, we, we, in 1998, uh, Manitoba Harvest was started. But there is the pre-story, which I just started to get into, pre Manitoba harvest as well. Sure. So, so tell us, yeah, dive, dive further if you want to go into the little bit of the pre story. I mean, anything yeah, else? Sure. So, so part of, um, so that, that's how Manitoba harvest started because really the innovation of finding the shelled hemp seed and then that company started. But pre that, and part of also going to the cannabis cups was that, as I mentioned, we found this seed um, from Ukraine that had super low THC and because at that time we had started to uh, to begin a lobbying process here in Manitoba to make hemp uh, legal once again to grow industrial hemp. We were we were never interested in uh, pushing the legalizing high THC cannabis marijuana, but uh, so we really separated ourselves. Not not saying that is a bad thing, but we were we really wanted to be very clear in what we were going after, and it was lobbying for. Uh, low THC, um, what say what they're growing in Europe? So mm -hmm. we had we had a model to go and say, look, they're growing it in Europe, they're growing it in other places. Um, and so you guys were like the leaders of growing hemp in Canada. We were the first in, the first hemp in the modern times. Let's say since yeah. the forties yeah, no, that makes was sense. grown in um, in Ontario in nineteen ninety four. Only grown for fiber, 
But really? we, we in 1995, were the first group in Canada to grow hemp for seed. So if it wasn't for our, our efforts specifically for seed, uh, I really don't think we'd be where we are now either. Someone else would have done it. It might have been at a different time, but there was definitely no one else at that time doing what we were doing. And it wasn't just us. We had formed um, in 1990. Four, it was the University of Manitoba Hemp Alliance Committee. Wow. And so through that, we had rallied people. We had done demonstrate. Uh, we had uh, parades, you know, shut down the main streets and paraded to the legislative building. And, Amazing. And, uh, and, but because we had found this low THC seed, mm -hmm. we then had some ammunition now to go back to our, our the head farmer, the Minister of Agriculture, mm -hmm. who was Harry, Harry Enns at the time. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be at the first meeting. It was myself and three other members of the Hemp Alliance Committee, and we presented the case. And he was like, yeah, like what you guys are talking about. This is actually very interesting. Come back with a proper proposal. You know, wow. that was just a – and he thought we would kind of go away, you know. But <laughs> lo and behold, three months later, we came back with seed – we also came back, if you look in the 1961 uh, UN Treaty, I wish I had the book in front of me, but there's a 19, it, it's when they ratified all the drug laws under the UN, it was, it was in 1961, and there's mm -hmm. actually an exemption for cannabis grown for seed and fiber. Wow. That's why they're allowed to do it in Europe. It's not because they're so much more liberal in Europe, they just got it and, you know, this, it's, it's, so it's, it's there. It's 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 a it's our right actually to be growing, but no one really knew that. So we right. knew it. We found the book. We brought that little book to the minister, and we brought our low THC seed, and we had a farmer that was willing to grow. And wow. uh, lo and behold, uh, in uh, January of 1995. Uh, we were given the rights to grow five acres as a test crop. <laughs> and not only that, we got a $25,000 grant from really? the Manitoba government, and they assigned us an agronomist to specifically work on this project with us. That's incredible. And uh, we haven't stopped since. So we grew five acres in 1995, and then it took three years to go commercial. So in 1998, it went commercial. And that's also when Manitoba Harvest was formed. That's amazing. So Hemp Hearts is basically your your flagship product, basically. It was like the one that kind of... Well, it, was the, it really, back in the early days, it wasn't the product. There was nothing because no one knew about hemp. But now, 100% Hemp Hearts is the most... Uh, I will have to say, for the record, we did not come up with a name. Uh, sure. It would be nice if we did, but it was another brand out there that was using the name. Uh, they had some different marketing approach. I'm sure people listening to this might have even bought in hemp hearts before they bought them from us. And uh, it was just this other company just didn't, they, they, they weren't poised to... Mm -hmm. Break the mark, break into the market the way we were, and do all the work that we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, they laxed on their trademark application and let it slide. And so <laughs> we we don't have it now that it's been in the marketplace so long. The courts have said no one can have hemp hearts because it's there's so many brands that are called. That are we're just the most. That recognized hemp hearts definitely but the regional. ones that you find at like costco and all that kind of stuff is you guys it sure is okay that's sure I, I mean look first of all i i want to kind of before i even ask you another question i have to give some serious applause and praise for the fact that you have made this possible in canada and it's not just you and i know it's an enormous amount of people but just the fact that you played a role within it yeah. is super super like impressive and awesome you Thank have you. no idea. I mean, like, I, I get. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure that you're on the side of understanding that hemp is a super plant, right? It's just this sure. kind of absolutely incredible plant that we are kind of rediscovering today. Like you said, in modern times, um, many, many people forgot about hemp, and only now, I would say, yeah, maybe about since you know late '90s, early 2000s more and more people have been talking about it and even today i think there's a lot of people who are very still 
very much confused with what hemp is, right? And how it's grown and what the laws are. And in America, you're not even allowed to grow hemp. And maybe some people have some special permits and stuff. But for the most part, most Americans get their hemp uh, superfoods and, 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 and products and stuff from abroad, right? So, I mean, this is still a tiny market compared to what it could be and will be in, in today's times. And I would love to hear more about where you think hemp is going. Um, you know, like, so you, you've been a part of this for a while now. You were, you were part of it, you know, making this uh, a thing literally in Canada uh, and is now definitely a growing industry that's making its way to Quebec. And I'll, and I'll get to that in a bit because, you know, Valhalla dreams of hemp as well. Uh, and we're working on it tirelessly to some degree. Uh, not so, you know, our, our climb into doing something like this won't be as complicated, I, I think, as yours was for sure. But I'd love to see or hear, sorry, what you where you think this is going. Like, you know, as you've seen this grow and flourish and as you've seen all the blogs talk about hemp as a superfood and hemp seeds as, uh, as part of the, that category of, of nutrition. Where do you think hemp is is going to go? Like, do you think this is going to grow? Do you think, you know, sooner or later we're going to replace some of these GMO corn and soya fields with hemp fields? Like, what's happening here? Uh, yeah, I, I do believe that. I mean, uh, that's actually a good point because there was um, there, there was an article not too long ago, and I can't recall, sorry, which paper, but they had started um, canvassing farmers and they're like a lot of can canola farmers are definitely looking to switch to hemp mm -hmm. and uh, because what happens is hemp isn't a commodity yet which makes it a very interesting uh, crop for farmers to grow because every single other crop pretty much that a farmer would grow is is a commodity based on international commodity pricing well wheat's down this year we're going to grow canola Canola's down this year. We're gonna grow, bar you know, barley. Or they're always switching based on what's in demand. So mm -hmm. you're not gonna get a, a canola farmer growing canola every year if canola's starting to tank. So their farmers are always looking to diversify. And hemp is is actually very stable because it's a pure supply and demand of a limited product. So it's not something you can go out on the open market and, and put a bid in for a million pounds of hemp seed every month because it doesn't exist. Yeah, so it's a much... Basically, yeah. everyone who's growing it has already sold it before they've even grown it at this point. Pretty much. So it's a more intimate relationship that you have with your farmer and your community, which, which is nice because you actually get to be part of this community. And as that grows, that will, that will evolve as it's going to evolve. But certainly... Um, there's more and more acre opportunities to put it in perspective in in the prairies alone uh, i believe it was 20 million acres of canola wow okay so there's maybe 100,000 acres of hemp so oh, i think there's God. some room to grow no kidding that's, what, that's what's very exciting we're already at this point yeah, where we have products in costco we're lining up with all the top retailers in north america expanding globally um and there's only a hundred thousand acres we're, we're growing about fifty thousand acres uh, in so 20, you guys are growing fifty thousand acres we're, we're we're pretty much half of the hemp that's grown in canada and then all the other wow. companies combined make up the other half that's incredible. That is in that is absolutely amazing. That it, like it's incredible that there's only a hundred thousand acres yeah, of hemp isn't that, that are wild. Growing. That's it wild. Is I know. Wild. And it so is much is happening with that hundred. So it's a very uh, you can see you're getting a lot of impact out of a small like look to twenty million acres of canola. And quite honestly, I could live without canola oil. I, I try not to consume it. If I do consume it, it's organic. I know it's in, in more of an industrial use is okay, but definitely. But but where is all this twenty million acres of canola going? I can tell you where the hundred thousand acres of hemp is because you can see the pro. There's no there's no wastage. There's no I don't know. It, it's uh, I mean it's I, I could only imagine. Carefully tended to for sure. Tw twenty million acres of hemp. Wow, like we're talking a whole. 
different paradigm where this is a whole different world now this is so so uh, yeah. somebody who's never eaten hemp or never who hasn't even considered hemp like let's let's dive into that why hemp like why should people eat hemp why why is it, why is it a superfood or why is it uh, a wonder plant i mean i i definitely know the answer to the, some of these things but i'd love to uh, have you dive into sure this. well i mean um the, the big one is uh, the macronutrients, like the protein and the fats. So it has this uh, really great protein uh, source. It's about 30% protein by weight. So wow. it del delivers a big punch of uh, pure plant protein. Mm -hmm. From a lot of the research that's out there uh, within the hemp world, it's it's got this protein makeup called edistin and edistin is is a very bioavailable uh digestible source of protein mm -hmm. uh so that's you know that's a positive um and then um it's also about 30 percent fat so primarily within that 30 percent fat it's 75 percent essential fats wow. meaning that's the omega-3 and the omega six essential fatty acids. Mm. Uh, um, along, you know, along with that, it's just got a whole array of great vitamins and minerals. Like it's an amazing source of magnesium and manganese and Which folic most people, acid. Most and, people are are low in magnesium, right? Yeah, that's a huge problem in in our current adult yeah. population is that yeah. many many people are not getting enough magnesium, and people yeah. forget about this. I mean, and, vitamin D is another one, but but magnesium is a huge one. Yeah, uh, iron. It's got twenty percent of your uh, your iron in one serving of uh, hemp hearts. Wow. Yeah, so it's like thirty uh, thirty gram serving. Uh, you know, two three level table two three tablespoons wow. worth or so, and you have twenty percent of your iron. So especially for women, I mean that that's a huge one. Um, and of course, the flavor of the hemp hearts are, are really nice, and they're super easy to use. You just sprinkle them on anything, your mm. salads and yogurt, mm. great in smoothies. So I think they've gotten a lot of... Uh, yeah, they're, they're, really they're getting... definitely part of my smoothie game. I can't yeah, give you that for much. sure. <laughs> Me too. Smoothies, uh, you know, as soups, just any, you know, thicken things up, and salads are probably my favorite. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's just got this great profile of essential fats uh, it also has um, a gla gamma linole gamma linoleic acid which is um something you would find in evening primrose oil so also really good for hormonal balance and um you know so it's really it, it, it's it's got a nice balance of vitamins minerals antioxidants proteins fats and tastes good and you can get it in different forms. We have protein powders. We have the hemp hearts. Uh, I know there's going to be some exciting new products uh, coming out in 2015 mm. and um, and and beyond. That's I mean, they're the so company. Keep going, right? Oh yeah, the company is poised to to continue uh, its growth curve. Just in it, it has not stopped growing since it started, which is. That's an exciting, cool. exciting ride to be on. It is never, in every single year, it's continued. Uh, it's it's been anywhere from thirty to fifty percent growth every year. Oh so it's God. a it's a pretty wild roller coaster ride at times. And uh, it seems like quite the game to to jump into, right? I mean, quite the space that that is really um, flourishing. And and it what's amazing is I was doing a lot of research on on hemp. I was doing a lot of research on farming. I was you mm -hmm. know. Uh, here at Valhalla, we have a 60-acre piece of land, and we're trying to transform it. And what we took over is this giant GMO corn soya field on rotation, right? Basically, a Monsanto-like kind of chemically doused field, yes. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but slowly but surely, people are going to have to do this, right? This is the kind of change that we're needing to see. And our goal, what we started with, was things like permaculture. Excellent. And permaculture is really interesting to do on a small scale. It's really interesting to do right. in a city landscape. It's really interesting to talk about and to teach. But it's not necessarily so productive in terms of being able to grow an enormous amount of food for an enormous amount of people because it's very labor intensive. Like, it requires so much attention. It's unbelievable. Like, the people who think that being sustainable or being off the grid is, is an easy job 
are just misled. Um, it, it, there's so much work that goes into permaculture. It's, it's really insane. And over time, it, it's like a lot of work up, at, up front, which is what we're feeling right now. But over time, it obviously uh, ideally gets a little bit easier and the, and the plants get more mature and, and stronger and rooted and all that kind of stuff. But it's not something that we can do on such a massive scale without kind of scaling up an enormous community of people who would have to take care of it with us uh, year after year. So we also have been looking at like, what can we do to grow organic hemp, right? What can we do to make this massive field that is still, you know, used for corn and soya because we had this contract with a farmer, um, you know, that's not that we haven't touched yet because we've only started on five acres. What can we do to stop that? And with this current machinery that this farmer is using, how can we, or, you know, with some small upgrades or changes to the machinery, how can we grow a, an organic product? And the best answer that we had to this was hemp, right? Like we did mm -hmm, so much sure. research. There's so many farmers. Most farmers, I think it's uh, like 45% of all farmers are, uh, are above the age of 55 and then in Absolutely. Canada. And mm -hmm. then I would say like, I think it was like 70% are above the age of 40 or 75% are above the age of 40, which is crazy. That means there's an enormous amount of labor shift that's going to happen within the next 10 to 15 years, easily, right? 10, sure. maximum mm -hmm. 20 years, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anybody, because I grew up in the city and stuff, I don't know anybody who's taking care, who's thinking about this in any way, shape, or form as to how, like how we're going to really transform some of these GMO corn and soy fields into something a little bit more productive. And, and I've seen the struggles of these farmers Growing this, the, the one farmer that I deal with grows 3,000 acres of land on his own, right? Like he's doing 3,000 acres of corn or soya every year on his own, and he still has an, like a hard time paying all the bills. And he hires numerous people and has, you know, uh, equipment that's worth millions upon millions of dollars because it, farming equipment is enormously expensive. Yeah. And the only thing that, you know, he, he, he got pretty excited when I started to show him the numbers of non-organic hemp because it takes three years for, you know, hemp, right. you know, to growing mm -hmm. for, for, for it to be certified organic. Um, yes. And then also the numbers of organic hemp. And he was pretty astounded. And, and yeah. he, I, I got to say, had a little bit of resistance, though. He was like, well, you know, I've heard like one, one or two farmers tried it out and, you know, it's a little bit complicated and then the government's going to be up my ass and all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And I can't, I can't lie. I, I definitely feel like maybe that is true. I don't know. Right. It's like, what what have you guys noticed as being your experience for growing growing hemp over these years and and now that you're doing it on such a large scale i mean what are some of the 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 strong points of hemp in terms of actually growing it and then maybe what are some of the the things that people should be looking out for and, and you know if they're considering doing and changing their farms into a, a hemp fields well it's excuse me it's definitely come a long way yeah. um specifically on the varieties that are available now, uh, like when we first started growing these these strains from Ukraine, were really more specifically fiber strains. So they were growing; they would produce seed. That, that wasn't a problem. But mm -hmm. uh, we had plants anywhere from peaking at up to fifteen feet tall. So that's wow. a nightmare. So when the, actually uh, two combines burnt down in the early days mm -hmm. because what would happen and this isn't a this isn't a scary but it's a real like what the, the because just the fiber is so strong that it would keep wrapping around and the friction and the heat and <sighs> dust and boom it just like it was the wow. per and it just caught on fire and <laughs> and uh but that was really because it was the early days uh there's always going to be more more risk uh learning curve what what farmers here in the prairie say is they and this is how the this is when you've gotten to a point with a crop mm -hmm. and you've removed the risk mm -hmm. that's what hemp is you can't prevent the risk of mother nature no that that's not what we're talking that could you know we don't know that well but there's always droughts in certain things we're not talking the, about that but we're talking yeah. about the risk like farming risk and the terms risk of meaning knowing when to plant and the price and knowing all that kind how of stuff. to keep it growing uh, knowing, yeah, knowing you have this end, you, a contract in place, and uh, uh, um, and and knowing that the variety and and the harvesting technique. So you've taken all those risks out. You know this combine's not going to burn down. 
because you know how to, there's all, we've gone through all that. So it's become much, much uh, more of a standard operating procedure to growing hemp. It's, it's been done so many times and there are varieties now that you can grow maybe four, four foot tall. Wow. And easy to combine. And so that four foot tall hemp is better for seed because it kind of exactly. gets there faster. And, exactly. and there's less and, yeah. fibers that you have to process and that kind of stuff. Yeah, because we're in the seed game. And I mean... Um, the, and, uh, and, and, some, and many people are in the... Uh, the fiber game in terms of like people who are making, I don't know, insulation out of hemp or making clothing out of hemp or making hemp creed out of hemp. Well, um, th that, those are, those people are looking more for fiber, correct? Th those are, no, those are actually, uh, that comes off of the seed crop. So, so what really? we grow is called dual purpose. Okay. We're growing for seed, mm -hmm. uh, but the fibers do get used, but those fibers have uh, more limited, or I'm sorry, not limited. They have, there's just less of it. They have specific uh, end uses because mm -hmm. what because it's gone to seed. Mm -hmm. It's a coarser fiber, so it's great for hempcrete. All those things you mentioned. Yeah. It's great for hempcrete. It's great for insulation. Any yeah. non-woven carpet backing um, mm -hmm. liners that you find in a vehicle, like anywhere. Yeah. So not like for clothing, but good for for like you said, coarser exactly. products or whatever that are made out of hemp. The fiber for clothing is gr that is hemp grown for fiber. That hemp never sees seed. Wow. It is it's harvested right as the male plants because it's it's most mm -hmm. ninety something percent of all the hemp crops grown in Canada are dioecious, meaning there's males and females both mm -hmm. grown together. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as the males are about to start shedding pollen, that's when that gets harvested. Wow. Yeah, okay. and that's a super fine, that's a finer, silkier type of fiber, and that's what would be going into clothing. But we don't do a lot that of here because there's no You're in the food game processing. Right? There's no there's no processing. That's all done in China. Mm -hmm. yeah, like all the hemp clothing yeah, I was I was in China and walking with my buddy um, in 2010 and we were talking and talking and talking and then all of a sudden I kind of get this smell of, I want to say, I thought it was weed uh, mm. and I look up and I see this massive hemp field mm -hmm. and I was just like, oh my God, I was so happy. Yeah, like yeah. I was so happy because I'm, look, I've smoked weed in my day. Okay, I still smoke weed from time to time now. Um, and, and let's be real here. Um, hemp, when you see, when you stumble across an open field of anything marijuana or hemp related, you're going to be excited as, as somebody who has smoked it, as somebody who wears hemp, as somebody who, who supports this plant, as somebody who sees this as a, as, um, you know, a, a, a way of, of stopping or, or slowing down deforestation, a way of restoring the, the amount of uh, the crazy amounts of GMO uh, and pesticide ridden uh, fields that we have in the world. I mean, hemp to me is like the solution for so many, many problems. It's unbelievable. And, and it seems like it's also, like you said, it's a wonder plant in the sense that it could, it could do so much. It's not just uh, for food. It's, 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 we can make hempcrete out of it, which is a, a concrete replacement. We can make clothing. We can make uh, like insulations. We can make, different construction materials but there's all there's so many uses that have been have been kind of laid out for this so many more yet i'm sure to be discovered as well and this is all again with with such a small percentage of crop right like if you think about all the millions of acres that are being farmed everywhere so, in the world gmo acres gmo acres yeah. now you can grow a organic product put a lot less into the soil i mean I, i'm assuming that if you guys are doing a double crop you do put some fertilizers and stuff, but that doesn't mean um, that it's non-organic. You're just putting, you know, you're helping it out with fertilizers and whatnot. Well, but well, it, it also are. requires much less water. It requires so much, like it's so much hardier and more natural of a plant to most environments that it's just, it's it's incredible. I mean, I can't believe that more people are not growing it and being a part of it. And it's because there's a massive stigma surrounding it and, and what it means. And people are scared. They're fucking... They're just scared of what hemp means and, oh, it's marijuana and drugs and, and they associate it to that and it's it couldn't be further from the truth. Hemp is not a drug. It's not so psychoactive and, and it's purely just like another crop that's way better for everyone involved. 
Yeah, I I agree, and uh, but I, I think the layers, you know, it's like an onion, and the layers are definitely a lot of layers have been peeled from when I first started uh, mm. in this game. Uh, I, you know, I've been doing all of the events, and I've done every single event pretty much that the company did in Canada as far as promotion events, because that was that was my role and then I started I took over all the US events about 3 or 4 years ago so from wow. when we first started uh probably 7 out of 10 people had the legitimate question am I going to get high because mm -hmm. they really didn't know no one asked that now if the, if someone says it they're being kind of dumb and silly <laughs> and then I kind of ber berate them a little not too but I'm like come on and like I've heard this too many times I don't yeah. want to hear it anymore mm -hmm. okay sorry it's like I know so I mean people know and yet yet there still is sure there's lots of confusion but I think um we had our victory in 1995 when we were granted the um the um permit to to do the testing for three years and then 98 it went commercial and then it just everything took off but the real victory is um gonna now be in the u.s when when that takes off because the u.s um innovate oh it is it's it's happening now it's it caught because colorado and washington state have legalized marijuana uh Which colorado colorado doing so well yeah so colorado also has a very strong uh, hemp initiative, so they are doing things. Uh, one of the big things I know they're working on is uh, phytoremediation because, like, that soil is so contaminated in that state through mining. Mm. And uh, so, that another remarkable thing is hemp will um, uh, uptake heavy metals. They actually grew hemp in Chernobyl to help clean up the soil around no Chernobyl. Way. Yeah, it's 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 documented. Oh you can my check god! Check it out online. That's um, amazing. Yeah, so there, that's this. That's called phytoremediation, and so that's what they're doing. Uh, this phytoremediation project in Colorado. Uh, I know Kentucky is going to be growing hemp uh, in 2015, all all under test. But Kentucky used to, that was their, I mean, right now, the biggest cash crop in Kentucky is cannabis, illegal cannabis. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's bigger than tobacco. So, you know. It's, it seems uh, like even tobacco, big tobacco is going to get in on this, right? It seems oh, like. Oh, they are. They, they, uh, they, not yeah. on less, necessarily on hemp as much. Well, maybe, no, I think they're going to the get cannabis. on hemp too, but the on cannabis, cannabis for sure. Yeah. They're going to have cannabis cigarettes. Well, they understand smoking, right? They, so whether you're smoking a cigarette or you're smoking a joint. Yeah, it's smoking though. It works. They they get that game, they and uh, it'll be a you know their little hidden subsidiaries that are you know going to be be in the can. It's not going to. I don't think you'll ever see a Marlboro, but you'll see some company owned by Marlboro. That's, yeah, yeah. It won't know. it won't rock the major brand just no, yet. It'll but be then three it'll, la three layers down. Yeah, be, yeah. But it's know. still owned by the same big sure, corporation. Yeah, sure, makes sure. sense. But but hey, okay, that's fine. Like it's all. So I think the the the. To me, uh, the U.S., that's going to be really interesting because if it's just a bunch of 10 other companies that want to get into the hemp food game and make more, 10 more brands of hemp parts, well, I don't really think the market needs that. And I'm not saying as, you know, that would create all this competition first. It's not really, you know, you, you can only have so many bags of hemp parts on the shelves at Whole Foods. and. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, you know, because we have a partnering position with them, we've worked really hard with them that just because uh, four other brands knock on your door, they're not, so th it, there has to be innovation. Yes. And without innovation and growing hemp, you have nothing because you can only like have so many hemp oils and have so many hemp arts. The real innovation is going to be in the fiber. That's mm -hmm. my, uh, I see. I see hemp creed being used. Yeah. Huge, huge opportunities in the fiber game and the the biocomposite materials that can be made mm -hmm. uh the we'll probably have a lot more hemp oils i believe as well in terms of like um just i i feel like there might be able to make it, different industrial grades exactly yes, exactly yes, yes, yes. i feel it's like that's going to yeah. start coming coming into yes. it and it's like Who's to say that maybe one day our cars aren't you know, lubricated with hemp oils instead of these synthetic crazy oils that they have? I mean, I don't know. I have no idea well, what's possible. Well, if we want to, you know, uh, escape the the stranglehold of the petrochemical um, 
industry. spider web that we're yeah. in, then uh, yeah, we have to think <laughs> other mm -hmm. ways to use to create products that already exist. But mm -hmm. now let's. So for sure, I mean the the natural product in, in Germany, it's a mandate uh, by the top uh, by the government for like BMW, the top automakers. Thirty percent of the material inside their car has to be from natural fibers. Really, and that's hemp. Yes, so it's it's they they've created uh, so that same innovation can be brought to the American car. It, it's just it's dollars and cents. I mean, it mm -hmm. makes no sense. Because there's no dollars being made yet, but once but there are nobody's it, dollars are being made because it, they, they're not allowed to to, yeah, allow, to grow so, it and, and, and try and, and exactly. you know do now, this now now we're at the door the door has been open mm -hmm. we're in now we're gonna crawl there's a there's a tsunami of hemp I think it, coming it's it's coming and there there there's money in America for oh, yeah behind the hemp movement like there's there's people that are waiting would love to invest yeah. in in legitimate hemp businesses that mm -hmm. uh so i mean it's so that's that's happening and i and you know i mentioned at the top of the podcast val agency you know we've been working with an organization that's coming up here in quebec called all so green gold uh, kind of as a translation okay. of that. And it's amazing because their their whole game is to promote the hemp industry in Quebec. They're almost like a lobbyist education type group okay. to promote the growing of hemp. And and they have started on like a thousand acres around Quebec, which is, again, peanuts compared to, you know, whatever other people. Like just that one farmer I deal with grows 3,000 right. acres, right? So, yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, but what's cool is that they're they're making it happen and they're they're coming up and, and they're, you know, they're getting their, their training wheels uh, you know, rolling and, and, and they're, they're, they're riding the bike, but, but still with training wheels and stuff. But, you know, one of the interesting things as I researched this is that hemp is still pretty restricted and it's not restricted by the Ministry of Agriculture so much as it is restricted by the Ministry of Health here in Canada. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, when we were looking at this, I was like, well, what if we could grow like one acre over here and give it a test run? And I learned that that's not possible because you have to grow a minimum of 10 acres to be able to get this one of these licenses and permits. Correct. So, and I, now I can create a whole bunch of different scenarios in my mind as to why that is. Number one, they don't want to give out permits to everyone and then kind of not be able to check up on all of them to make sure that they're not marijuana fields, right? Number one. Uh, and then I think, I think the second thing is that they kind of, because of that, they only want serious players to get into this game because or else it, it could become a shit show in the sense of, of the drugs. Now, Again, I, I'm all for the legalization of marijuana, period, okay, or hemp and marijuana uh, both. But, okay, look, I guess that, you know, marijuana and drugs might lag behind. But I'd really love to see what we can do to grow more hemp. And I find it pretty challenging to find this information. Now, I was able to find it through this organization here, and we did some website work, and we're continuing to do some work with them on that front. But I would love to, you know, learn more about how, how can people who are listening to this right now, maybe they have fields, maybe they don't have fields, maybe they want to buy a farm or they want to start, um, you know, changing uh, some GMO corn field into, uh, you know, organic paradise of some kind and building off the grid house or something or whatever it is. How can they get more involved? How can they, how can they learn more about this stuff? Where, where are some of these resources that maybe you guys have written about um, and, and, you know, where's the, the paved path that you guys have now kind of created? Um, well, I guess, you know, th throughout our, our history, we all, we've always had a really close relationship with, uh, um, the minister of agriculture and, uh, Manitoba agriculture. Um, you know, they've been big supporters. I, I don't know the, the path really, I guess would, is that it is laid out, uh, on the health Canada website. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't have the exact information in front of me, but definitely, uh, probably is it, th that's where Health Canada has a section on their website. It is interestingly enough uh, under Health Canada's jurisdiction, which is silly. We've been the hemp movement has been trying uh, to get it into Agriculture Canada for a long, long time, mm -hmm. and uh, really strange why it's still under Health Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's not a drug. <laughs> mm. it, it's under the cannabis. That's the only reason why it's there is because of its relationship to cannabis. Mm. 
but uh, it's obviously uh, not a drug. It's mm -hmm. not being grown for drug purposes. So it, it would make life much easier if it was under Agriculture Canada, uh, because then it's one one group controlling the whole thing. Now you got to go to Health Canada. You got to work with Agriculture Canada. You have to work with two people instead of one person. So, uh, but as far as I know, the, the the best information would be on the Health Canada website. And uh, yeah, the ten acres that's been in place for a long time. That 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 was one of the, that was like right out the gates since mm -hmm. nine, since ninety eight. It's that hasn't changed. And, you think that's uh, going to change? Um, I don't think it's a bad thing to be honest with you. Ten acres. I mean, yeah, I I. It would be nice to grow, but it, it's not. Ten acres is showing that you're committing at mm -hmm. least. You know, you're putting in enough commitment. A certain amount of resource to yeah, buying that because, land and doing that kind of stuff. Because, because otherwise, it's not, yeah, it's not ornamental. It's not. Uh, it's you. You can't grow it ornamentally. It would be great if you could grow six plants in your garden and attract some birds and stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, and it should be. It really, but it's a, then the police the are dream, all, right? we're confused. We don't know. It's like, yeah, you know, how much training would that take? You seem to know what cannabis smells like when you pull up to a car. You're seen, they got all this expertise when they seem to need it. <laughs> but you could take an afternoon of bloody training and you would know, oh, that's yeah. obviously not, not cannabis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not a waste, you know, it's, but yeah, in a, it would be nice if there was ornamental, but you know, ten acres keeps people. If you're not serious, then it keeps basically the stoners yeah. who ruin it for the rest of us at bay to some degree. And it's unfortunate to say that. It's not to say that stoners are bad people in any way, shape, or form. But sometimes they they're they're not so, they're not going to be so careful with um, how they're going to treat this delicate issue, and it actually might create more stigma and more problems for the movement um, versus actually help it. Yeah, well, you know, it just it, it makes it something uh, that if you're going to take it on, you're taking on ten acres, and if you can't do that at a minimum, then you shouldn't even be thinking about getting into the hemp game. It's kind of like you know, you got to drive at least sixty kilometers an hour on the highway, or mm -hmm. you should be on the high. You're, you're, you know, it's just you're not ready. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, and that's because the goal of farmers, right? I think uh, most farmers. You know they're gonna they want to grow to make money, and ten acres is probably the minimum that you could actually look at getting some kind of a return on as well mm -hmm. and, and as we've grown for us uh you know it's you kind of work with farmers that are doing at least a hundred acres mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Just or you, yeah. I can imagine they're doing even more than that oh yeah it was some yeah. I think we have the largest contracts or in the three to five thousand acres wow which is a big commitment for uh, a farmer you know there's so, so now, now we have farmers their whole crops a thousand acre their thousand acre farm is all hemp so are farmers making more money growing hemp than they would be growing uh canola or or corn or soya like is it, that is that a normal like yes. so so do most farmers who are like oh let me you know i'm listening to this i'm a farmer i'm, I'm interested in doing something like this um should they what kind of you know what should they be expecting now i know you know the numbers more catered towards manitoba but that's a pretty good sample for for other areas as well so what what can people expect if they're going to make the switch or consider the switch you know um i'm out of that loop a bit and um but i it's a dollar dollar 25 somewhere in that range per acre hmm yeah so hmm. Uh, you know, it, it averages that that on a, you know, it's about five hundred dollars, anywhere from five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars an acre. Okay. You know, and that's so, and that's like purely growing and then selling to somebody who's going to process. Yeah, that's on contract. Yeah, you know, you that's basically to, like uh, like you know, hemp hearts or your Manitoba harvest, for example, will buy this hemp from you, yeah, and then that's how they do it. They contract with farmers, and but you never know. Let's say, okay, you're contracting a uh, hundred acres. Mm -hmm. but we don't know what the yield's going to be. We have an average yield that's going to be around five hundred. If it yeah. ends up being a bumper crop and they're getting thousand plus, then it's good times for the farmer. And we yeah. buy all that, so we we don't, you know. Um, you guys so buy based on weight. Prepared. 
that's where we're in a position to, you know, if it's big bumper crops, well, then we buy the seed. So the, you know, yeah, the company, it, it's, 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 it's positioned to be able to take advantage of all of the opportunities kind of now that comes its way. So once you're in that place, then that's amazing. Then growth gets accelerated exponentially. But, you know, it took a 15 years to make that happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so do you think there's more people um, learn about this? Like, so I know that, for example, right now, hemp based products and proteins and stuff are pretty expensive, uh, I guess, relative to some of the other, uh, you know, protein sources that somebody might be able to find. Now, uh, I, I definitely know why you should consider to buy hemp anyway, because it's way healthier for you. And things like whey proteins and stuff are not so great, uh, in my opinion, at least. Um, but the it, do you think like, I mean, you you mentioned your company doubling or growing or not doubling, but like kind of growing, you know, whatever, 30 to 50 percent a year over the last since 98, basically. That's amazing. Do you think this is a trend that's going to continue? It, like, like yeah. what happens if somebody starts growing? Like what happens if a whole bunch of people start growing hemp? To All right. Testing one, two. All right. That looks um, recording. Perfect. Well, if a whole bunch of people start growing hemp, uh, and of, yeah, the, it's it's all supply and demand, hundred percent, like mm. any of the other commodities. And but what what they don't have with hemp is there isn't any speculating, and so there's none of this crazy false predicting game. So there's no speculators that are here making money. There's no, so mm. it's a lot more pure economics. So um, if way more hemp started to grow. And there was this, you know, glut of, yeah, of course, prices would drop for seed. And, uh, um, but that's not a healthy way for a, a market to grow, I think. It's just got to grow naturally and organically where you're, you're keeping your, you have enough supply, but you're not, not oversupplied. But what happens is that you grow more and more and, uh, other competitors get in the game mm -hmm. and other people get in the game and it, then it's it a becomes business. it's a bigger business and then price that way pricing will come down because pricing really more comes down through competitive pressures mm -hmm. um, or, or of course commodity decreases but um, it, it's you know I, I think the pricing isn't really that bad it, it's not that I don't think it's that bad expensive. either I'm just it's saying really, I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts were on it yeah no I think you know as more grows yeah for sure the pricing could, could come down you know as I said there are 100,000 acres so um, it's it's definitely lots of room to grow and uh, I, I'd love to see the pricing being more affordable for mm -hmm. sure it'd be wonderful I think uh, um, you know, hemp is for the masses. It's it's it'd be great if it could be on every family table. Mm -hmm. So, how can we help you? I mean, we we did all this talking. I all you know, I asked you a whole bunch of questions about hemp and, and what you guys are doing and and Manitoba Harvest kind of role within this. But how can we help uh, not only Manitoba Harvest but you personally? Um, is there anything that you would like to see uh, happen? You know, how how can you know different people listening to this right now? Um, find a way to aid you in your mission of kind of growing this movement? Well, I think uh, you probably vote with your dollars. Mm. Buy, buy something hemp. It doesn't have to be our brand. I mean, sure, it'd be great if you want to buy some Manitoba Harvest products. They are good, and they're uh, you can find them at good pricing at different retailers, but certainly just by supporting. I think that's how I always uh, vote. I don't vote. Uh, I haven't mm -hmm. voted since I think I voted when I was 18 for the novelty of it and <laughs> never went back. So, but I vote with my dollars every day mm -hmm. and, uh, I try to make some wise votes and, uh, uh, avoid the foolish votes. And then I'm really in direct control of, of what I'm trying to manifest for myself and community. So I think if we all do that and just support what you believe in. Okay. Vote with your dollars and that's, buy, more, buy more hemp. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, that's I, how the company. That's really how the company started. It was uh, I'll just tell a little story. Nineteen ninety eight, when we uh, started, we started with hemp oil, and mm -hmm. we we uh, I think we bottled about 
I don't know, 20 cases of hemp oil. And we took one case to a store um, in the east, east end of uh, East Kildonan and part of uh, Winnipeg to one health food store, mm-hmm. which was the first. They're still there. And they are recognized as the first store we ever sold in. They had 12 <laughs> bottles in their fridge. And uh, we sent all our friends to go buy it. So within two days, all 12 bottles were gone. That's and the, sto- the store didn't know that was basically our whole kind of crew coming in to buy it. But he's they like, were wow. just like, he's like sell wow, us that- more. <laughs> he's like, that stuff sold really fast. Well, that was awesome. So they took two cases. <laughs> <laughs> and this time we actually only had to buy maybe eight of the 24 because uh, 16 strangers I picked it bought up. hemp. Yeah, and then from there it just literally grew. So, so without everyone else who supported us with their voting, with their dollars, then we would definitely not be here, of course. So it's, uh, it's pretty wild to see how that that's to have awesome. been fortunate enough to have been around to see from ground zero to to where the company is now would, would have hard to been hard to imagine uh, being on a Costco shelf fifteen years ago. I I can imagine. Yeah, that's I, I mean, <laughs> again to applaud your efforts, Manitoba Harvest efforts, uh, and and everyone who's ever voted with their dollar as well. I mean, uh, thank you so much for your just continued support of this movement and and just how much you guys have, have really radically changed the face of what it means to grow hemp or anything related to cannabis in any way, shape, or form, right? And and people can, you know, while if they see hemp in their in their local grocery stores and stuff, then they'll start to be okay with it growing in their backyards. And that's kind of the next step, right? Is, you know, 100,000 acres is one thing, but how can we, how can we turn that into a uh, hundred million thousand, you know, a hundred million no, no, acres. Exactly. Something. And it's the like, more, it, yeah, just like you said, the more you see it, the more it becomes legitimized and then becomes part of the culture and, and then the culture yes. accepts it and, and people exactly. eat it and then they get yes. the good proteins. And I mean, there's massive protein problems in the world, right? Yes. Meats are yes. a pretty interesting, uh, you know, issue that we can dive very deep into. Uh, but, you know, given the fact that we're at the tail end of this, all I can say is that the fact that that hemp exists could be one of the major uh, players in saving a lot of the different, uh, you know, problems that we're having in the world today, yeah. whether it be of water usage in agriculture, which is the biggest use of water, whether agriculture, agriculture being the biggest kind of contributor to global warming, um, uh, whether, you know, the, the amount of, you know, the average American eating nine ounces of meat every day. Uh, we can, we can replace a lot of these problems or kind of, fix a lot of these um, issues with the growing of hemp and and this is necessary so Valhalla's j- diving in this is something we are looking into uh, more and more and more and we're, we're, we're trying to find more information and we're trying to find somebody who can who can get us the strains that are approved by Health Canada which this company now uh, that we are dealing with yeah. seems to be a potential candidate for but we're looking I, for I, I can help with that Oh, you can? Okay, great. Yeah, That's sure. amazing. Let's, let's stay in touch for We'll sure. definitely stay in touch because definitely, we're definitely looking for somebody. That, yeah. yeah, we're looking we're looking for it. And um, yeah. we're looking for a farmer to be able to kind of show us the ropes too. We've never operated. I, look, dude, I'm a city kid, man. I, I, I never, yeah. I learned marketing. I didn't learn how to grow right. food at all. Um, well, I'm sure you felt the same way. But then slowly but surely as you learn exactly. about it, you, 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 it happens, right? And, and anybody listening here is probably not a farmer. But chances are they might need to be in the future or they might want to be in the future. And, and there's certain there's a, a, a good amount of us that are going to need to take over the farms that are going to be left vacant in the next little bit. And as as, as opposed to, you know, us going in and growing GMO, uh, you know, Monsanto kind of products, let's figure out better solutions that allow us to have a healthier lifestyle um, all around, whether you be the grower or whether you be the consumer. At the end of the day, hemp really is uh, a wonder plant. It really is part of the solution. So I really want to thank you for your continued efforts and work in this space. Well, thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. And uh, it's a simple solution. That's yeah. how yep. I think so, so many big problems that we create all these problems and this make things so complicated to understand in economics and but it's actually really simple. Mm-hmm. It is. They make us. They make us feel like we're dumb mm-hmm. because they make this complicated language people don't understand because it's actually a simple thing. It's just that supply and everyone demand. gets 
for the most part. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, hemp is a simple solution. It makes it, it's it's obvious. It's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a and common, it's a, common and sense. Amazing. So, um, for for those who are listening, if you want more information, all the links to manitobaharvest dot com, uh, to their Facebook page, and all that other stuff are going to be available. And be sure that if you support hemp or you have any, have any questions for myself or Alex um, or Valhalla or Manitoba Harvest or whatever, I mean, go and ask the questions. Ask us. We're, we're, we're here to, you know, um, to support this. We're here to answer some of your questions. We hope to get to all of them, uh, depending on how many come in. Um, but please leave a comment, subscribe, uh, rate the podcast. Con like all of that stuff is super, super helpful. So if you love hemp, one of the best things you can do, not only with voting with your dollar, is uh, you can also support it when you see it online. Now, I'm not even just talking about this podcast. When people are talking about it, when you see it out in the culture, let other people know about it. Tell your grandmothers and parents and stuff. Um, that's what's going to change the world. So um, for those who, uh, yeah, so back to the, uh, the, the sponsors, go check out Agency dot Valhalla movement dot com if you do want to hire us to do some of your marketing work you are a social enterprise or company or individual we're more than happy to help and uh also the higher purpose project dot com all of the notes and stuff will be uh in the links below so thanks alex yeah thank you very much thanks for listening be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and don't forget to rate and leave a comment. Until next time, be the hero you've always dreamed of being.